heart of Wellington, Kansas, Powder and String Outfitters is your down-home, one-stop shop for all things shooting sports and outdoors. Welcome to the Powder and String Podcast. I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Powder and String Podcast. I'm your host, Kip Etter, and I am coming to you from the downtown Wellington, Kansas studio, Powder and String Studio. And with me today, I have special guest, Justin Spring. Justin is the executive director for Pope and Young. And uh, Justin, I've had a couple of interactions in in this world before, and uh, so it's been... Uh, my pleasure to have him come on here and we're going to sit here and talk some Pope and Young and we'll probably lead into who knows what else in the outdoor world, but Justin's a wealth of knowledge with regards to, to that kind of stuff. So I greatly appreciate you, Justin, coming on. Uh, maybe you want to start off by telling our listeners out there a little bit about yourself, your background and, you know, where you came from and that kind of stuff. I appreciate you having me on, Kip. Um, you know, I, Originally, I came from the uh, Southern Oregon coast. I have a degree in uh, natural resources. Um, After getting done with college, worked for a couple uh, of timber company doing some wildlife work, worked for a state doing some fish aging, and then uh, landed at Boone and Crockett Club in 2008. I spent 15 years at Boone and Crockett, where I started the assistant director of records and ended up running the records program over there. And then, uh, you know, always had a really good relationship with Pope and Young. So in uh, last October, made the move over as the executive director for Pope and Young. Still very involved with Boone and Crockett, very passionate about the scoring side of things and conservation. So, you know, that that's kind of how I landed here. But, you know, my my wife, my all of our, our life is hunting and fishing and talk about it working, talk about it in our free time. So that's just kind of what we do. Yeah, I can attest to that. I know um, you and I... Uh, I think we uh, initially met each other uh, at the ATA show this year. So that would have been what, January, I think, uh, or maybe even, yeah, I think that was January, early January. And uh, f- since then we've stayed in touch and it seems like about every time I, I, I open up Facebook or I run into you or talk to you, you're, you're, you're on some other type of adventure. <laughs> Yeah, no, be, being in Western Montana works out really well. We're pretty close to a lot of really world-class hunting and fishing opportunities. And, you know, having a wife that loves it as much as I do. I mean, we we hit the road at 5 o'clock on Friday. And, you know, we were within striking distance of a lot of pretty amazing uh, destinations for a weekend. So and it works out well. Yeah, you've, I mean, you, you your adventures are, are not just um, limited to, to you know big game i mean you were you and i were talking about um you went duck hunting where were you at just just recently or i mean last, oh, yeah, last year on, uh, st paul island yeah um yeah king eiders out there um you know in alaska we actually i drew a an emperor goose tag again this fall so we're headed back up to the Aleutian chain this this october we're gonna do a little bit of fishing out there chase some ducks my wife's going with me on that and so you know, it uh, just depends on what the uh, what the tag draws have. My wife drew a really good uh, archery oak tag here in Montana. Actually, the same tag I had, oh, what, 16 or 17 years ago. The year we moved to Montana, I drew this tag, and she's been trying to get it ever since and drew it this year. So we have pretty exciting September uh, lined out ahead of us chasing elk over there with her. Yeah. Tell us a little bit. I mean, I've I've heard a story, but for our listeners, tell us a little bit about that duck hunt up there because it's it's a completely different. It's not your normal <laughs> duck hunt. No, so the uh, the king eider were actually it's a it's a northern bird. Um, when you go up there in December, January, you know that that is the very southern edge of their range. They're an open sea bird, and so the St. Paul Island used to be where they offloaded a bunch of the snow crab when that that fishery was happening in the Bering Sea. Um, since that has not happened the last three years, there's really not a whole lot of people going there. So there, you know, at one point there was some infrastructure, there's a grocery store, there's, you know, a few, uh, the, the, the local, um, the native population owns most of the houses and everything. So they rent those out to the hunters. Um, there's a little, you know, bar slash grill that's open a couple nights a week, but there's really not a whole lot out there. And, and you're going out in the Zodiac into the Bering Sea, you know, praying for a, a weather window and, 
once you get out there, these are an open open ocean bird, so it's not your normal, you know, you know, decoys in the in the shallows or anything. You're you've got a line of decoys out there and big rolling waves and you know, they come in hot and they disappear and you know, go behind a wave and then reappear right on top of you. And yeah, the the whole experience is just pretty amazing, amazing to see out there. So you're in a layout boat? Blind? Oh, uh, for the for the eiders we were in uh basically just in a big zodiac and so we were set up you know in the boat we when we did the the Aleutian Islands the uh Emperor Goose that was layout and you know I was a bunch of sea divers up there and you'd see walruses on the shore and whatnot and so you know I think a lot of people get confused of like you know man why would you go all the way to Alaska to freeze your tail off and lay in a layout to go shoot ducks but I mean the stuff you see, it's it's the experiences of going those places and meeting the people and seeing the different wildlife and everything. There's a, you know, a refuge out there on on the uh, the Aleutian chain that honestly I'd never would have seen if I wouldn't have got that goose tag. And so, you know, no, it seems really ridiculous. We don't want to figure out how much that goose breast ended up costing us per ounce, but <laughs> you know the the experience. It was the experience. And to go and see these places has all been pretty awesome. Yeah, the experience. So you're in a. I mean, is the is the weather condition similar with and and the the, the location is similar for, for the Emperor Goose? No, it's it's the the Aleutians is quite a bit further south, and it's it's earlier in the year. Um, you know, historically speaking, while that you know you're battling historically they battle sea ice, so you you may not even be able to get out and hunt the eiders unless like a crab boat came in. I talked to people that had done it before, and like the whole harbor would freeze up, and so they were hoping a crab boat had an offload date that would break the ice and that allow them to get up there and actually try for the, for the eiders. For us, it wasn't that bad. The, the weather, I mean, there was some big rollers, some big waves, but we really had pretty darn good weather. The wind wasn't too bad. You know, when we were up there, we were there between uh, Christmas and New Year's and, you know, all, all things considered, I mean, flying out there, flying back, no, no real delays. It went pretty, pretty much as smooth as it could, but you know, I, I can say all the, the places I've been in the wildernesses and the big game hunting and whatnot, that uh, flying back from that island on the charter plane is about as small as I've ever felt in the wilderness situation and anything I've done. I can't even imagine. So when you're hunting the eiders, you said a Zodiac. What is a Zodiac? I'm, I'm a it's flatlander a, it's from like Kansas. A, yeah, it's, so it's a... Um, Basically, it's a rigid hold raft, right? So you've got a, you've got a, a rub, basically looks like a raft around the edge, but it's got a solid bottom on it. And so they're just made to handle really rough water. Um, you know, they're, they're very stable, very safe boats, but it, it, it handles that stuff a lot better than your average, you know, Lund or something like that. Yeah. And I can't even imagine that, that, and I'm, I'm sure, sure you're in, you know, and not, not that it matters, you know, 20 foot of water or 200 foot of water. But if you were to happen to go over, that's, you can pretty much kiss yourself goodbye. And yeah. The water temperatures up there. I mean, it, you don't have long before hypothermia sets in, but you know, it's, it's really anytime you're in that type of situation, that really cold water, you just, you know, got to keep your head about you. And the, the gear we have today is, it almost seems like cheating. You know, I mean, there's a lot of these companies now that you know, you look at 20, 30 years ago when people were doing this stuff, they didn't have these high end, you know, technical gear stuff that dries super quick, is, insulates warm and cold. Right. You know, it's like I said, I think I think we we have it kind of plush now. And a lot of folks don't necessarily realize that. Yeah, but it's still, um, you know, it's still not for the faint of heart. I'm, I mean, mm. I, no, what you're what you're doing, the, those type of hunts are are pretty. Uh, you know, they're pretty few and far between to find somebody that would want to go, you know, go do and go and do something like that. I mean, for me, it worked out well because my wife's a, a big time birder and, you know, it's like, hey, you want to go out the Aleutians or go to say, you know, go to this island. And, uh, you know, people come from all over the world to go birding there. And I was like, hey, we're going birding. We're just carrying shotguns. So it worked out right? well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can you can carry a shotgun if you want, or you can carry a camera. It doesn't matter either way. But we're, we're going right. to get you in, into some birds that you're probably not going to see just uh, on your regular little hike. Yep. Yep. So, so coming up, you're you've got that same trip. Sounds like planned for this year. Yeah, like I said, that emperor tag. There's 25 non-resident tags that are drawn, and we always put in for Alaska and all the western states. And 
somehow I miraculously pulled it again, which it's very rare to get. So I'm sure a bunch of people are going to be mad at me, but, uh, you know, got, you got to play to win, I guess. And so yeah. I happened to draw that again this year and weren't really planning on doing a trip, but obviously you drew the tag. So we're going to head out there a little bit earlier than before. There's also some really good brant hunting, which are really delicious, uh, goose species Pacific brant. And that's where the majority of them live out there. Um, you know, just, just kind of try to see it a little bit different time of year. We had a brant goose that, you know, must've taken a left when it was supposed to take a right, um, back <laughs> in the late nineties here in Kansas. It, um, you know, it frequented the the area where the lake where I hunted, the Wellington Lake where I hunted. And, uh, I, you know, everybody, of course, around here was like, what in the world is that? Myself included was like, what in the world is that? And, you know, we're talking, you know, back way before Google and everything. So, you know, the old timers and, you know, all of us got out our books and, and ended up, you know, game wardens and, and, and it was around for a couple of weeks or something like that. Maybe, maybe a little bit less, give or take, but, um, sure enough, that was what that was. It was a Brant goose. And that was, that's the only reason I know what a Brant goose is because of that and how, you know, just completely ironic it was that one of them would be, you know, in the middle of the United States. Uh, yeah. but, but pretty, pretty cool little story. Um, I know earlier, um, you know, you, you went on a bear hunt here recently with, with, uh, Dylan and, uh, ha, ha, give us a little bit of the, the background on, on that. That, that what sounds like it was right around your house. Yeah, no. So I, uh, basically, I mean, it goes back to when, you know, right when I turned 12, Oregon outlawed the use of, uh, bait and dogs for, for the hunting of bears and mountain lions. It was a, a ballot initiative that, that went through and, or do a whole podcast on the, the dirty pool that was played there, but how, you know, Crystal oh. Oregon's management ability. Well, by the time I turned 16, nobody had really been hunting the bears for about four years and spot and stock was the only way to do it. And so when I turned 16, I had a, you know, an F-150 manual truck and I'd go drive around in the state forest and figured out this spot and stock bear hunting. And, uh, you know, nobody was doing it at the time. So, of course, we thought we were rock stars, but we were the only, you know, the only kid on the court playing basketball. Of course, you're the best. Right. But uh, over the years, you know, I just kept kind of doing it. Montana was a similar situation that we didn't have. Uh, oh, we weren't allowed bait or dogs for bear hunting in Montana. So it was all spot and stock. So when I moved out here, we kind of, you know, formulated a little bit different plan it's a little bit different food sources but have done pretty well chasing the bears in the spring so you know right around the house here i mean we've got a really good bear population and uh had dylan come out and show up show him some of the montana mountain hunting scared him a couple times i think turning the truck around on some of the mountain roads and yeah um he did pretty good i gotta say i thought i was gonna smoke him up the mountain he, he hung with me just fine going up but turning around coming back down i got the flatlander and so got the lead coming back to the truck i felt a little better about that can't let the young guy beat the old boss yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah yeah so if you had a if you had a favorite hunt species to hunt hunt what what's that look like what what is the one that you love want to do that you you know you look for every forward to every year man i i don't know if there's a single species i mean I was pretty into the bear hunting for quite a while and still am, but I actually, you know, I have the last probably six or seven years, I haven't shot a bear in Montana. I get just as big of a kick of taking people out and getting them their, their first bear and helping them out. And, you know, I kind of like bear watching now. I mean, there's, there's a bear out there I'm still looking for, but he doesn't exist in very many places. So, you know, that seven foot bear, that 20 inch skull, we go up to Alaska, you know, went back to Oregon, had a great hunt there with a good buddy of mine that, you no, know, was associated with the military. He'd been overseas for a while. He's back, back stateside. So we went for a week and camped and had a good time chasing spring bears there. But, um, you know, it's I honestly couldn't limit it to just one. I mean, I, I don't think I could hunt one single species the rest of my life. I, uh, you know, whatever tag I happen to get happens, you know, that that's what we put our interest in. I mean, I really, really love moose hunting. I've been fortunate enough to get to chase a few of those around and, uh, in a few different places where uh got to you know hunt them on my own and had a lot of fun with that always interested in doing that but i kind of joked once i killed my moose in alaska we did a float hunt and the guys i took with me couldn't you know couldn't take the meat off the bone and they couldn't carry more than 70 pounds and so 
we got the moose out and got it all recovered, but it was a, a year of physical therapy to get my hips back into shape. And it's like, I don't know if I need to shoot another one of those, but I'll go with somebody, but they have to be the one that carries it all out. I, I don't have another one of those hunts in me. Yeah. I've, you know, I've heard that story echoed many times, uh, amongst, you know, individuals similar to yourself that'll go on those hunts and, and, uh, you know, we've talked about it quite a few times here on the podcast of, you know, people that, you know, that maybe haven't been on a hunt like that, you know, especially out West or, you know, in the mountains anywhere. Um, the, the number one thing that, that everybody that, you know, individuals like yourself that are, that have been on these before that they, they echo over and over is make sure you're in shape because it's, it's just different hunting. Yeah. You know, it's, it's also a mentality. I mean, a lot of people meet me and they know I've get, done these crazy things and I'll admit I'm not the guy that's in the gym every week. I don't, I don't train constantly. My training is splitting firewood or spending time in the mountains. And, you know, a lot of it comes down to mental. I mean, yeah, if you, you know, if you bite off way more than you can chew and you're bonking in the backcountry, yeah, you're in a world of hurt. But, you know, I've found it's more just that mental tenacity of like, all right, we got an oak down in this crappy spot. You know, what do we got to do to get it out there and just don't quit till you're done. And, you know, that goes a long way, but definitely, you know, being used to the mountains and, you know, the elevation, that that's the thing yeah. that really surprised me. I drew an Oregon mountain goat tag and, you know, I was in great shape. I was working in the woods, doing uh, owl surveys, climbing up and down mountains every day, you know, just got done with playing collegiate soccer. And I got up there to, you know, close to 10,000 feet and, uh, man, it messed with me. I got a cold and like, it was hurting my lungs and I was spitting up pink coughing so hard. And, you know, that, just things like that, that, you know, you got to be cognizant of and not push yourself too hard. But at the same time, you got that don't quit mentality and you're smart about it. You can pull off a lot more than you think you can. Yeah. Yeah. Mind, mind over matter type. Yeah, for sure on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if, so you, you couldn't limit it to one species that you're, you're, you know, that you put your thumb on that you call your favorite boat. So then let me, add, let me pose it this way. What about the one that you haven't hunted yet that you're most excited about getting you know next the next box to check man i uh i'd really like to get a mountain lion um without the use of dogs um either either predator calling one in or you know cutting a track and i mean using the same tactics as the dogs but i feel like that that's kind of my current challenge is can I get one of these things and, and not necessarily dumb luck. I mean, you can come across one out elk hunting or whatever, but like actually going out and saying, I'm going to target a lion without the use of dogs. Could I do that? And it, it's a, it's a pretty without tall one order. Trying, you. Well, I mean, it's a cat. That doesn't count you know? either. When, when, I, when, when they come, <laughs> if they're, if it's targeting you then and you're the prey, then that doesn't count either. It's right. That's okay. If, if you could be, if you could beat them at their own game, that, that, I mean, obviously doing it with a bow would be amazing, but I'm also realistic. Like I'm just looking for a shot at a mountain lion, you know, without the use of dogs that I, I think that's, that's probably my next big one. Like I said, that goes back to Oregon growing up there and not being able to use dogs. There's some areas in the state that are very overpopulated with lions. And there's some guys that haven't figured out that they'll go predator call and they'll call in a lion, you know, a couple of them a year. That's interesting. And, you know, I that that really intrigues me to go back, try to get a good winter, you know, winter snow that you can get around and then just go see if you couldn't call call a lion in. Um, yeah. That That's probably my next, you know, really horrible ideas my wife would put it <laughs> so i think i've shared it on here before um on previous podcasts but i moved from you know from kansas to arizona and uh one of the you know at that time one of the top one you know animals that i wanted to hunt and it was in, that it was in that area was a mountain lion and i had you know coming from kansas i had zero you know knowledge of what that what that you know was but i just wanted to hunt one and um so having no experience of, of it at all, not, you know, never hunted it, never didn't really, you know, I, I honestly had not ever even really followed it or read, you know, but we're talking back several years ago again. Um, you know, that's back to when, you know, it was magazines and, you know, Google didn't exist, but, um, in, in that world, I, uh, I had some, some clients that owned, you know, they were ranchers and farmers and they owned some ground. And I told them, I said, Hey, I want to go, you know, shoot one. And they said, Oh, we can get you some dogs. You know, we hunt them. And, all that stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to hunt them with dogs. I want to hunt them just like hunt them, hunt them. And they kind of laughed at me. They said, well, 
that's not really how that works. The, you know, no. you know, you, you, they only let you, if you see them, it's because they let you see them. Um, you might, like you said, you might happen across one. And I was like, really? And, uh, so my, I still have a desire to go hunt one, but it, it went down, you know, n- notched down several times, but what you're talking about would definitely be, uh, you know, that's kind of next level if you would. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not it, from a management perspective. It's not, you know, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea that I'm not, you know, a fan of dog hunting. I, I think it's, uh, you know, traditionally, I mean, for managing lions and whatnot and bears in many cases, it's a, it's an amazing tactic and watching the dogs work, you know, in my mind, I mean, that's that you're just a shooter on that hunt that the dogs doing the training and the dogs work in the animal is really the beauty in that, you know, and you know, like I said, for me, I would never be opposed. I'd love the opportunity to go do it with dogs. But, you know, for some reason, I just want to see if I could if I could make myself sound like dinner and get one to come in close enough that I could get a shot at one. So have you shot a mountain mountain lion yet? I have not. I've seen I've seen a handful of them out um, just, you know, randomly in the woods. Uh, we've seen them elk hunting we watched one sitting on a rock at about 2,000 yards which is a pretty cool thing it came out and I was with my wife and the, the director of uh, records now for Boone and Crockett we were elk hunting and it's like dude, what is that goofy looking deer and it jumped up on a rock and just sat down and was watching the same drainage we were elk hunting and it's like man that's pretty cool but again 2,000 yards away not a whole lot we could do there and then seeing a couple of them run across the road we haven't come down through our yard we actually had a uh Oh, uh, a mom was teaching her adult kitten, you know, how to hunt. And they killed a coyote pup right across the street from our house. And my wife went out and actually has it recorded on her phone. But the the chirping, the, the mountain lion chirping of the, the kitten and the mom oh, yeah. talking back and forth. And this coyote, this coyote mom, they killed her pup and she was yell, yelping and making it. And it was one of those things like, holy crap, like this is National Geographic stuff going on yeah. in the yard. And, you know, That's they're around. Cool. You don't see them very often. That's, you know. I've spent my whole life in the West in very good cougar habitat. And I, you know, count on one hand, the number of truthful, you know, experiences I've had with them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty wild stuff. Cause you just don't, I mean, you don't see them and, and, you know, I, I don't have anywhere near the type of experience, but, but talking to individuals like yourself that do, um, you know, very few people see them and they're they're but they're out there for sure. Oh, yeah. We, uh, here just a couple, well, you know, for the longest time in Kansas, it was, you know, this common, you know, ongoing, I don't know what you call it, back and forth joke, whatever, but the, you know, fishing game said they didn't exist and, you know, everybody had seen them, everybody had seen, you know, sign of them and all of this different stuff. And let's see, I mean, I, I know I moved back from Arizona in 2011 and at that time there was still no official word that they, that they existed. And then now that they've, now they've, now they've fishing games officially said, yes, they do exist. And I know that, uh, prior to that, we were out looking at, you know, it was, it was late summer and we were, you know, out scouting some deer hunting ground. And I was with a buddy of mine and we, it was a particularly dry summer. So the corn was real low and, and we were, I was walking down in a, in a, the, uh, Creek bed and he said, you know, all excited, holy cow, you know, and I was like thinking he saw something, but he was in a cornfield, but the corn was really low because of the drought. And, and, uh, I said, what'd you see? You know, I kind of come up out of the Creek bed and he's standing there looking down. And I mean, you know, Prince, you know, well, <laughs> it was actually, it was as big as my hand like that, you know? Yeah. And, uh, then there was two sets right beside him, you know, in this mud puddle or uh, what was a mud puddle. And I mean, being an outdoorsman and you know, you know, I mean, that was most likely a mom with, with, with at least one or two cubs, uh, or kittens, yeah. excuse me. And, um, then it wasn't just about a couple of years later that they admitted that they were, you know, around and then there was, you know, actual sightings. And one of the sightings was just within, you know, 12 or 15 miles of where we had seen that. And then here, just a couple of years ago, they actually had one in Wichita, like in the city limits, somebody caught it on their doorbell door, you know, camera or something. I think it was going down a street or something, but it was, it was kind of in an area close to the river, I think to the, to your, the, uh, Arkansas river. But anyway, it, you know, they're, they're definitely here, but they're not like, you know, in the numbers that you have out there, uh, at all. But it's, it's, it's one of them things. It's kind of, when I hunted that ground from that point on, anytime I would go walk to my stand in, in the morning, um, I didn't feel quite as bad, 
but at night I would take my stand down and put it on my back. And then I was carrying a pistol in my hand. Cause I just like, I'd, and it was a long walk. It was about a mile walk from the, you know, from where my stand was at in that particular spot to the truck. And so, you know, the whole time I'm like, I got this, my, my, you know, my portable stand on my back in case this thing came from behind. And then I'm walking with my bow, you know, on my shoulder, but then I also had a pistol in my hand and I'm just like, you know, I'm, I don't know how this is going to go down if it goes down, but I'm at least going to go down fighting. But it, it, you know, yeah. it's a completely different deal, especially around here, you know, to, to have something, have that, that, that element, if you will. No, we, uh, one of my first jobs out of college was doing, um, marbled murelet and owl work and on the Oregon coast. And we'd have to hike in before daylight to get to these stations and, you know, be looking at the, looking for this bird to be flying back from the ocean to bring in a, a fish to its, its young. So you're hiking into some of these nasty areas it, well in the dark, you know, you had to be there an hour before sunrise. So pitch black. And I stepped on something soft and I heard this thing just scream at me. And of course I'm like mountain lion. Well, I panic. I swing the headlamp around, you know, have a pistol with me. There's a little bobcat there huddled under a, a tree. And I look down and I'm standing on a rabbit that had just killed. And man, that's as close as I ever got to getting whacked <laughs> by one. And it wasn't even a lion, but right. I can tell you, dude, my heart was up in my throat. Oh, and I, I was, yeah. yeah, I I had a hard time concentrating on anything for the next couple of days out there after that happened. Oh, I could only imagine. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a different, it's a different uh, element when you're out, out West, you know, cause there's, there's multiple <laughs> things out there, multiple critters out there that can get you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But. So with regards to, to, you know, we've talked about it, uh, Pope and Young and, and, you know, the powder and string, we've worked with you guys several times mm-hmm. on stuff. And uh, we recently did a, a couple of uh, shotguns for some uh, giveaways that, that uh, you had at some of your events and stuff like that, man, we, we sure appreciate you, you know, working with us and we're glad to be a partner and, and associated with Pope and Young. It's such a great organization, but maybe if you want to tell the listeners out there a little bit about Pope and Young and, and what it stands for and what it does. Yeah. So, um, you know, Pope and Young started in 1961. It was, um, at a time that they were trying to validate the use of archery equipment as, as a valid method of take. There was a couple States that were allowing it, but it wasn't widespread. And so the, uh, the founding members of Pope and Young were members of Boone and Crockett and they said, Hey, Boone and Crockett, can we use your scoring system? to promote the use of, of archery equipment, create archery seasons, and, you know, basically set up this the structure that we have now where archery hunting is so prevalent basically throughout, you know, all of North America. Um, and they've, you know, the organization since that time, I mean, obviously it's now a recognized weapon. It's, it's uh, I'm, there's not very many places you can't use a bow for anything that you're hunting anything else with. And so they succeeded there. And you know, our mission now is just kind of, you know, that of any any conservation group, ensuring that, um, you know, the public acceptance of archery continues into the future. So the North American model can uh, continue to, you know, fund wildlife management through, you know, hunter conservation as dollars. Um, You know, we, we ensure that um, obviously the, 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 the habitat aspect of it. I mean, if you don't, you don't have wild places and good habitat, you don't have any game and hunting goes away and, you know, the, the fringe of, of, of all that as well. I mean, yeah, we're concentrated on big game, but at the same time, you know, when you have a, a solid habitat where all the big game animals are in good, you know, good balance and they're all healthy, all the other non-game animals benefit from that as well. And, um, you know, we've also always kind of been the, oh, the, the voice of, of reason, I guess you could say in terms of looking at new technologies coming down the pipe. And, and is this, is this advantageous for us as a bow hunter? Is this, is this something that we need to adopt because it makes us a better bow hunter, appreciate it more? Or is this, is this relying more on technology than actual hunting skill? And so we spent a lot of time kind of debating on, you know, what, what we should be using for our bows, what, what equipment and what, what technologies are appropriate in different situations again, to ensure public acceptance and that the hunter still gets the same satisfaction out of that, uh, you know, pursuit of game with a bow that, that they always have and that it continues into the future. Yeah. And I mean, it's so important and we've talked about it again, many times on the podcast here, but you know, you, you kind of touch base on it there just for a minute with regards to, to the, the conservation. And, and we urge people all the time. We tell them uh, on the podcast, we explain just because 
you may not be, say, a duck hunter. If there's a Ducks Unlimited banquet in town, go to it. And just because you may not be a bow hunter, if there's a Pope and Young event in your area, you know, go to it. Because um, we recently had um, uh, Peter Churchborn on from the NRA. And, I mean, some of the numbers that he was spitting out with regards to hunting and where we're at with, you know, the population of, of, of people that hunt compared to what it was, you know, you know, 20 years ago or 40 or 50 years ago, 60 years ago, et cetera. And, and, and the projections moving forward, um, you know, this way of life that, that means so much to, um, you know, many of us, you know, like yourself, myself, and, and so many others out there, it, it's, it, we're in the, we're on the, uh, in the minority by far. And, and it's not, you know, it's not, there's no change looking, uh, in the future with regards to that being, sw- you know, swinging in any, any other different direction, I guess, barring some type of, you know, zombie apocalypse happening <laughs> to the entire country. And then, and then we'll all be hunters again. Um, but the conservation of it, you know, just, just because ducks unlimited, um, you know, just, I mean, just speaking just here locally, you know, they, they just recently, uh, purchased a piece of ground. It's a walk-in hunting area that, you know, the hunters can hunt it. But it's a it's a really good duck hunting spot, but it's also really good for, you know, upland birds. So it doesn't just, you know, the, you know, the, the Rocky Mountain Elk Federation doesn't just um, benefit just elk. You know, it, there's a there's a huge species, a huge swath of species that are that are protected by that. And then also it's, you know, it's just the hunting in general, the, the, the lifestyle that we all just, you know, we live by. No, it's it's uh, I mean. One of the early early members of uh, first basically modernized wildlife management, Aldo Leupold, you know, this idea of ecology and how everything's connected. Man, the stuff we've seen now, you know, why why does the uh, run of salmon on the Columbia affect you? Well, look at look at how many nutrients are being put into those coastal habitats that feed the black bears off the salmon coming in. You know, all these natural resources and everything that we have, I mean, it, it's all interconnected and you know, yeah, I mean, everybody's like, oh, you're a big game guy. You work for Boone and Crockett and then Pope and Young. You know, you also chase ducks. Yeah, man, I'm passionate about seeing ducks everywhere and fish everywhere and, you know, the big game. And if, if of all our natural resources are doing well and, you know, whatever your your favorite animal may be, if that's your if that's your introduction and why you get involved, great. But, yeah, like you said, Kip, I mean, all these organizations, the end of the day, we're all working for a lot of the very similar things. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but there is the uh, – AWCP, it's American Wildlife Conservation Partners. And again, this was started, oh, 90s, maybe late 90s, early 2000s. I can't remember exactly, but Pope and Young was one of the founding members of this. And basically what it is, is all these organizations, the different critter groups, the grouse guys, the deer guys, the elk guys. We said, hey, man, we're all 99.9% of the time. We're fighting for the exact same thing. And so this organization was started that has a very solid um representation in dc i was actually at their meeting oh this spring and both the uh, director of fish and wildlife service and the director of blm were both sitting at the table that i was at for that organization and so you know that's a, a lot of times you know you think oh man this 35 or this 55 or whatever i'm sending these organizations where is it going man when we have the top of the two agencies sitting there talking to these awcp members in these organizations you know, you're making a big, big difference. I mean, when the top of these agencies are listening to the sportsmen in this coalition, you know, your money's going to a good thing and a good cause. And, you know, we're all, again, fighting for the the lifestyle, the the opportunities that we had growing up so our kids and their kids can see the thing, same things and experience the same things. Yeah, and that, you know, that, that for lack of better terms, that fight is, I mean, it's constant, it's ongoing, and it's all-encompassing because not only is it, are we, you know, are we fighting necessarily for, you know, the right to be able to hunt, but also the right to hunt species, hunt them in a, you know, in an ethical way, um, you know, with all of the, you know, ballots that come up and, you know, that are voted on, you know, take Colorado, for example, what recently happened there, you know, state laws are passed at the ballot that people that have no idea what they're voting on, what, how that's going to affect things. And then, you know, that, and you, you, there's no way to, to kind of have this conversation without getting somewhat political, but, but, you know, that generally speaking, that left or, you know, that liberal group that, 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 that is anti gun, anti hunting, you know, all of that, they're very galvanized. And 
you know, that's the other thing is, is that, that we can't, that we also have to make sure that we're, we're, we're trying to do the best we can with getting out there is, is that how much, I mean, generally speaking, and I would say it's in the, you know, high 90% of, of, of hunters out there that, you know, we're ethical. We want to, we, you know, we're not just out to kill something. Um, I mean, here, great example, just this morning, I, I had a, we got a rental property and there were some raccoons that were underneath it. And I caught, I'm pretty, pretty impressed. I mean, I'm going to brag a little bit here, Justin, but I caught three coons in two life traps. So, um, but they were little ones and, you know, obviously, um, I mean, coons, you know, Kansas just opened up a, a state statewide, uh, or I'm sorry, year round statewide, um, harvesting of raccoons and trapping and all of that. And, you know, they're a nuisance and all that, but these three little coons, I, I'm like their moms there, you know, around, you know, I, I have a heart. I want to help things. I don't, you know, I want to harvest them. And when I harvest them, I want to harvest them ethically. And there's so much negative out there about, you know, us being barbaric and, you know, that we're, you know, just out there to, you know, shoot stuff and lay, you know, leave it lay. And there's, there's zero stuff out there that talks about the amount of funds that are, um, you know, paid and generated by um, the sportsman with the purchase of things, the Robertson, it's Robertson Pickman. Is that right? Pittman Robertson. Yeah. Pittman Robertson, yeah, and then there's yep. another one on the fishing side. Is that right? And I'm not a Dingle Johnson. That. There you go. It's the Dingle um, Johnson Act. Basically, the same thing as the Pittman Rob- Robertson. Yeah, yep. yeah. And I mean, you would probably know more. And I'm not don't mean to put you on the spot, but how many millions of dollars that that generates that goes into, you know, the the conservation and and it, that's what it has to go no, into. No, it's. I mean, you can you can look it up, and it it it's. I believe it's in the you know, billions over over time. Um, yeah. On how much money has been directed. There was a lot of states that, you know, conservation funding had kind of dropped. And, you know, with again, you know, without getting too political, um, there there may have been some some gun sales increases that those funds actually, in essence, carried a bunch of states when their funding was down from people that it really had nothing to do with hunting. I mean, the there's different sectors of the shooting set, you know, industry that they have no desire to ever go hunt an animal. They're just physically going to the yeah. range and having a great time. And and they're, you know, we appreciate it. We wish they understood that we appreciate it. And so that's, I always tell people, you know, you know, man, I may not be the biggest, you know, tactical cool guy that may not be my thing, but dude, those guys are putting in just as much money, if not more than us hunters. And so we yeah. got to support them as much as they're, you know, they're supporting we're us. 100% we're in this together. And that's like, you just, I mean, you just kind of touched, touched on that. You know, if you take, if you, if we were to categorize and I'm speaking kind of from the, you know, from the retail side with the shop that we have and everything. And I mean, if I took somebody like Justin using you, um, you know, as a hunter, you, you're not out shooting, you know, 20, 40, 50, a hundred, 500 rounds a month, thousand, 10,000 rounds a month of ammo. You've got your, you know, however many guns and, you know, use each one, you know, you've got your different ones that you use for whatever and your bows and Mm -hmm. all that stuff. And, you know, you're not, you're not out there buying, you know, ammunition and all the, you know, the latest cool gear. Um, so in a way you, like you're saying that the guys that are just the shooters that don't hunt, you know, they may contribute just as much or more than what we do as hunters to it. And, you know, amen, we appreciate that. Um, but, you know, again, it goes out to the, you know, we, we do a, we, we do a, as, as hunters and as, as, you know, shooters and in the two a world and stuff, we're not as, as galvanized and we don't do as good of a job of getting out there, the PR, getting it out there to tell people, Oh, wait a minute here. If <laughs> you know, the success story that you see with regards to, you know, using Kansas, you know, white tail deer, you know, there was, you know, or Turkey, you know, there was, there was very few to, you know, to any of those, either one of those species, you know, say, say, uh, you know, probably 50 or 60 years ago in Kansas. And now, you know, we're, we're a, a, a primo spot to come shoot a, you know, a big deer. And, um, you know, that, that has to do with conservation amongst other yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know, the other thing I always tell people too is, is, I mean, man, this country we're in is, is so politicized and, you know, on, on, on some, some issues in terms of, of, you know, the firearm, um, money, the Pittman Robertson, all that, you know, historically hunters generally are more right leaning because of that type of thing. But at the same time, you know, I always joke, man, in this conservation world, the deer doesn't have an R or a D on its hind quarter. You got to pull the right left and the left, right. 
you know, and at the end of the day, you ask anybody, they want to see more deer on the landscape to, within reason. I mean, obviously, we right. have certain areas that are overpopulated with whitetail. But I mean, at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We want healthy natural resources. We want healthy forests. We want to be able to go out and see the birds and see the, the fish and see the salmon runs and all that. We may have a little bit different way of getting there, but, you know, I find with all these groups, you know, and, and as hunters, that's one thing that we haven't done a real great job on. You know, there's some people that might, you know, socially on a couple other issues sit on the different side of an aisle, but man, they're great allies when it comes to making sure that, you know, roads are staying maintained on forest service and we're allocating the, uh, the amount of taxes to, to multiple use and all those different things. I mean, we got to make sure that we don't, we don't let, you know, we don't let politics, you know, have hunters as a casualty. I mean, yeah. we, we at the same time, you know, need, need to make sure that at the end of the day, we're ensuring, you know, the natural resources that made this country what it was. And the reason we were so successful so quickly, we need to ensure those are there for eternity. And that, you know, that's not always an easy job. And that's getting involved and in having conversations with people that you might not completely agree with. Justin, what's the number one thing right now that in from your in from your perspective that that conservation that we need to be focused on or that that that's kind of critical or, or or needs attention you know there's there's a few things that have happened and honestly i can tell the listeners you know what you're seeing in the news what you think these big fights are over whether or not the wolf should be relisted or the grizzly bear should come off the list Man, those are not those are not the fight. Those are the popular fights that there's money involved in. Um, there's things going on that you know are pretty far reaching. The fact that we had a, a crab fishery collapse in the Bering Sea for three years that's kind of gone under the radar. I mean, okay, so you're paying a little bit more for crab when you go to the store. If we think about that ecologically, that's a big deal. Um, you know, we've got it kind of happened under everybody's noses and not much was done. There used to be caribou, woodland caribou that would migrate into the Northern States. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt actually did a, a caribou hunt in the North, in North Idaho back in the day and he didn't get one, but there was caribou that came into the lower 48 and not long ago, they just trapped the last two of them and took them to Canada. I don't remember if it was two males or two females, but obviously it wasn't a viable population. You know, and so we've we've lost caribou in the northern United States and that nobody even knew about that. And so those are the things. Um, and wasn't there a if you're conservation there... minded, maybe not into hunting or whatever, you know, don't don't get pulled into the 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 rhetoric where there's money, the cute and cuddly things like, you know, oh, we've got to save the wolves. The wolves are being persecuted. The wolves are recovered. You know, the wolves are brought back on hunters dollars, conservation dollars. They're now and. I'm not a wolf hater. I love the fact that I've seen a couple of them in Montana, but they're a big game species. You know, let them be managed. Let's not fight over stuff that's doing well. Let's make sure that we're putting our, our dollars and our efforts into these far reaching things. And, you know, the caribou, I mean, they're probably never going to get to a huntable level. But man, when you're in northern Idaho or northern Montana, the fact you might come across one of them when you're out grouse hunting or something we're missing something, not having that. And so to me, yeah. those are more of the big issues. Don't get caught in this political knee jerk, you know, fighting. I mean, that, that needs done. You need to make sure it doesn't get too far, but there's a lot of conservation issues going on that, that need more attention. And, and secondly, you know, as a hunter, man, you know, we fight a lot about methods and technology and this and that. Anytime you're looking at something, say like, Hey, if I'm a non hunter, and I understand nothing about this. And I'm given the 10,000 foot view of what you guys are doing out there. Really like look at that with an open, you know, open mind and say like, would I be offended by that if I didn't understand what it was? Um, Amen. Is it cool to be able to ring steel at 1700 yards? That's awesome. Don't get me wrong. I've got a reloading room. I shoot like mad. I mean, that's, that's a skill that I love to have. But if we start talking about hunting at those distances, and you're not, you're not educated. You don't understand the practice that goes into it. You don't understand any of that just on the surface. Like, oh, I shot an elk at 1700 yards. If you're a non-hunter, you're like, is that really hunting? Or are they just out there killing things? You know, we just need to make sure that what we're doing and the way that we're expressing ourselves is, you know, palatable to the non-hunter that, that still supports hunting. They don't hunt themselves, but they're okay with it. 
Um, is there anything wrong with, with being, having the ability to shoot further? No, not at all. But, you know, again, what, what is the public seeing? Are there, you know, fair chase. That's the whole idea. Pope and Young's big on it. Boone and Crockett's been big on it. It's, it's, we've spent a bunch of time and mission on it. I mean, it's basically that, that ethical way of conducting ourselves in the field that basically gives us a license. Those people that don't hunt, but support it, their votes are the reason we can still do what we're doing. And so we need to be asking them, hey, is this is this okay? And if there's something we're doing that they they do not approve of at all, either we need to show them like, hey, this is the ethical way to do it and why we're doing it. Or maybe we need to consider like, hey, could we modify this a little bit? Because the wildlife belongs to everybody. That's how the U.S. was set up. A, a citizen in downtown, whatever big city that's never going to go in the woods has just as much right to that deer as I do. And so, you know, ownership and all of it and the approval of, of utilizing it and maintaining it, we need to ensure that that stays stays in our favor. Yeah, I I, I would 100 percent agree with with everything you just said right there. I mean, and, and it's the perception, too, that gets out there. Don't don't give any fodder or ammunition to to put to, to portray a negative light on this, you know, this this um, lifestyle that we we all cherish so much because man they unfortunately that's what they're looking for is something like that and and it can just you know, it can go south pretty quickly um but so you, you had mentioned about the the woodland caribou isn't isn't there a caribou species that's in canada or in alaska that's that's also not doing as well or maybe even it's it's numbers are low enough so you if, can't you even hunt at, it or? if you look at caribou numbers historically realistically there's there well I think there's technically three species scientifically, but for hunting purposes, I think we break it down to five. Well, I know we break it down to five for record book categories, but there's there's uh, there's there's different species of them, and none of them are doing great. Um, if you look at the caribou in the eastern part of Canada, the the woodlands, those have been studied a lot longer. There's just been people there a lot longer, and it's a <clears throat> it's a situation where the caribou numbers increase. They, they deplete the habitat, they deplete the lichen, there's a major die off, the habitat comes back, the caribou follow, right? So there's been three of these historic crashes in the Eastern population, which, you know, depending on who you talk to, it seems like now they're kind of rebounding, whatever. Um, but that's not as alarming. If you look at, you know, those, the caribou, the Quebec Labrador, those ones are ones that are in the central part of the country that no longer have any harvest whatsoever. Their numbers got dropped so low that they that they ceased all um, sport harvest of those animals. And there is still some you know First Nation harvest of them that happens, but you know they're not doing great. The woodlands, out of all of them, we're seeing some some top end trophies, which might suggest that the habitat is is primed for them to come back, but they're just the numbers aren't there yet. Um, a lot of the ones you're hearing about now in the uh, in the news and some stuff going on is the um, oh it's the it's the herd that, that goes out it's northern Alaska north of the Brooks Range there's some there's some jockeying going on between the um, oh I'm drawing a blank here um, Alaska has tea management. You can actually, on one hand, they met subsistence. There's a subsistence hunt up there that in Alaska, they're mandated by state constitution that they have to deal with subsistence hunters, which is federal. Then there's also the, the state hunters. And so there's some jockeying between state and federal jurisdiction over if the subsistence qualified hunters versus the sport hunters have access. In any case, that caribou herd, there's a management group that, that, that takes care of it. And it says if it gets under 300,000, management actions have to take place. Mm -hmm. Well, for three years, that herd was under 300,000. I think at its peak, it was up around eight or 900,000. Again, oh, wow. this could be cyclical, but all across the caribou's range, we're seeing a downward trend. And there's not a, a single specific thing that anybody can put their finger on to say this is why you know, they're, they're going down. And so that, you know, asked about conservation. That's another one. I mean, yeah, they, they're further North. Now there is still those woodlands are just over the border, but at the same time, you know, caribou in general are not doing well. And, and, you know, what, what's the cause of that? And nobody really has a definitive, this is it, you know, the, the classic, Oh, it's predation. Oh, it's, it's global warming. It's this, it's this. Well, 
in some cases, those might be a factor, but there's not that golden bullet of like, this is the problem. This is what we need to fix. Yeah. Yeah. I think the one that you talked about, uh, the Labrador one is the one that, I mean, there is no hunting. Uh, the numbers are Correct. so low, there is no hunting for it. Um, yep. And doesn't, so, I mean, obviously if that's the case, then that that would affect somebody's ability if they wanted to go out and try to to obtain the Grand Slam or whatever, the North American Grand Slam, they, they wouldn't be able to do that, be click, complete it because of that. And, and isn't there another one that's not available still, or there's another one that's off that list as well? Um, so you can't import. So historically, if you looked at the 29, it was polar bears and walrus yeah. were on the list for the overall 29. The current Marine Mammals Protection Act, you cannot import a polar bear or walrus from Canada into the U.S., and so you really, you could go up and hunt them, but they have to stay in Canada. And so those aren't really available, but, you know, again, it's not that, it's not that polar bears are in a, in a downspin, which, you know, the media may want you to believe they're actually in many cases doing quite well. It's mm -hmm. just a, a marine mammals protection that we, we cannot import them. And they've looked at doing it. And, you know, there's some organizations out there. Again, we talk about different groups that do different things and be involved with all of them. You know, there are groups that are really working on importation. Um, my understanding is that it's regardless of how the election goes, there's really not a party that would want to open that up. There's just too much baggage there. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, there's groups that spend a full time trying to get these importations opened up and, you know, support them as well. Yeah. So Justin, what's the next, um, well, I guess I, uh, let me, let me back up first. First, if, if a listener wanted to join Pope and Young, where, how do they go about doing that? What does that look like? And what is the benefits? Um, you know, what, what does that kind of look like to become a member? If he's so first Pope time? and Young has a, a very interesting structure. There's a, there's a general member, which anybody could go sign up for right now. And, you know, we, we've got some cool stuff in the works. I mean, we're, you can sign up as a lifetime general member and it, and it looks like right now we might have a pretty awesome giveaway at our convention for any lifetime that happens to go, you know, so you can get involved at that level from there. And when's the convention? Once you have take, what's that? When's the convention? Convention is April 9 through 12, and that's going to be in Glendale, Arizona next spring. Um, you know, anybody's welcome to come to that, that, that should be up online, probably about August one, you'll see the, uh, the events and the costs. We've got some really cool things that we're hoping to roll out with this. We've got camp chef involved. We're going to have a, a wild game cook off on Wednesday. So if you and, you know, a buddy or two, you guys think you got the best wild game cooking, you know, keep an eye out on that. The, the deal is you sign up for a team. You get to take the camp chef to, you know, to grill burner home with you. It's got a grill box and a, and a skillet on there. So we're going to have fun with that. We're looking at, um, we're going to do a ladies luncheon. We've got some folks that we're talking to, to you know, get more of a family feel. We've got some youth stuff going on. We're working with some different organizations there. So we're really trying to create a, a family atmosphere that everybody be welcome to, to come to. And, uh, you know, and, in uh, Glendale in 25, but, you know, back to the membership level, you know, if you get on the website, you can just, even if you've never hunted with a bow in your life and you just want to support what we stand for, you can come on board as a general member. And from there, the more experience you get, the more hunting you do, the longer you're involved, you can kind of rise up in that membership rank. But we, we want anybody aspiring bow hunter, retired bow hunter, even if you've never taken anything even close to a record book animal. That's not what our membership's tied to. It's those who support conservation and archery and archery into the future. That's who we need to come to our website and sign up to be a part of it. Get our magazine, learn about these topics and get involved. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know, I know that I, I was not a member until about, uh, I think I'm just over two years now and as a member and you know, once I got, became a member, there was so much stuff that, you know, so much, what is it, you know, you, there's so much you don't even know that you don't know, um, right. you know, that, that Pope and Young is involved in. And, and we've actually talked about it a few times um, on the, on the uh, podcast here, but um, as far as the record keeping and stuff like that goes, there's, there's, you know, so many different, um, different areas to that, if you will. And I didn't, didn't you guys just recently expand into sheds as well, or is that is that not so there's there's an organization out there there's the north american shed hunting club that does sheds 
Um, from a from for Boone and Crockett and Pope and Young, I guess for those records programs, I mean they need to be attached to the skull plate. So you okay. know, we don't accept that. But even then, we we did um, recently. We just announced that uh, we're adding a non typical Roosevelt and a non typical Tule elk category to our record keeping. Um, historically, you know those those animals weren't super prolific when they first were added, and so they were just one category. Well, turns out they're doing good. Conservation's working. Those elk are doing great on the West Coast. And so we felt that there's enough um, specimens that we should start tracking the non-typical of those two categories. And so that's something that we just announced. And, you know, again, I mean, even when I'm having this conversation, we, we all often concentrate a lot of doom and gloom on, on conservation and the skies falling and, and all that. But there is positives in there, too. You know, like you said, look at Look at the Kansas deer numbers. Look at the whitetail numbers. We're seeing some of the biggest deer we've ever seen. You know, we've got elk expanding in the West to the point where, you know, there's areas that we can't harvest enough. I mean, there was a time that the only elk found in the in the Western United States were in Colorado and the Olympic Peninsula. You know, now we've got them all the way to freaking Oklahoma and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Yeah, we got them in Kansas. So, yeah, there's there's positives there, too. Yeah, I you just know, talked to a so, friend of mine yesterday, um, and he's been on the podcast, Greg Gilman, and he lives up uh, in Manhattan. Um, and he said just yesterday, he said he he had uh, some trail camera uh, pictures of, of some elk on his property. Um, and he's it's awesome. He's uh, you know the Fort Riley herd is what you know where that came from, and I I believe now it's uh, it's actually two different um, herds, if you will, and you know that's a lifetime draw in the state of Kansas. You get you know if you if you get drawn, you get one one stab at it, if you will. But, um, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's a success story, you know, there. And, and we even have, of course there's stragglers, but, um, every couple of years we get trail camera pictures and have, we just had one come through here and then unfortunately it was hit on the interstate. Um, but you know, here in Southern Kansas, and I mean, you're talking, that's, that's 125 or 30 miles. Now where that one came from, I don't, I don't know that they knew or not, but, but, um, right. yeah, I mean, elk are everywhere compared to, compared to where they used to be. Well, I mean, before the, before the, uh, you know, the, um, market hunting. Yeah. No, I mean, it's interesting, you know, there, there used to be bison and elk all the way, you know, to the East coast. I mean, the, the fact that we're bringing them back and they're getting further East, you know, you could argue genetically, there might've been a little bit different elk there, the Eastern elk that, that kind of was extirpated, but they're doing their best to try to combine the subspecies that are there to bring them back. And, you know, there's there's some tremendous success, success stories of, of these reintroductions. And, you know, like I said, I mean, there there is problems. Caribou are a problematic one. Man, elk are doing great. Bears are doing great. Black bears, we're seeing black bears show up and in higher numbers than we've ever seen in history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, I did mention early in the podcast, I've been kind of a bear fan, but, you know, it's kind of been a student of it. Back in the day, you know, when, when the West, when, when the country was first getting settled, bear was actually one of the top items you could get in a restaurant. Like if you were going to eat the nicest meal you'd get, it was bear. And then from my my research, it, you know, people didn't want to be associated with that rugged frontier. You know, they wanted to be sophisticated. Right. And so that's kind of why bear fell out of, of you know, favor in terms of being served. And then obviously we had, you know, the, the different laws that outlawed the, the commercial harvest of game for um you know, sale and necessary, you know, what became necessary to save wildlife. But well, I don't again, think that you, know, you want to, I don't think you want to be, I'd rather be a cattle farmer than I would be a bear farmer. <laughs> man, I just love to see our, our country back to a point where we were, we were wild enough that, you know, there's enough bears that, you know, maybe we didn't yeah. have to farm them. <laughs> right, right. Now, I maybe I'm completely, maybe this may be one of them, you know, falsehoods that's just, you know, taken on its own life. But wasn't there also something to do with the with the teddy bear, with Teddy Roosevelt and the teddy bear that also made the bear where it was less desirable to, to eat or to harvest? So that, that whole teddy bear story, that was a hunt that was... Was it the Holt Collier Refuge? It was just recently created down there, Louisiana, I believe. Um, you know, he'd gone down on a hunt, and this guy didn't want the president to um, come down and not get a bear, so they straight tied a bear to a tree. Oh, my God. And so they go get President Roosevelt and walk up, and there's this little bear tied to a tree. And Ding Darling, who also did the first duck stamp, who was the one that wrote, you know, did the cartoon about that, 
which brought it to the national attention. You know, this cute little bear tied to a tree and Roosevelt saying, no, I'm not going to shoot it, which led to the teddy bear and the whole idea of fair chase. You know, I'm not sure if that's where people quit eating them because obviously hunting of them was still appropriate, but that was that was a big deal where Roosevelt's like, no, we don't shoot bears tied to trees. It's not just right. about killing them. It's about the hunt. It's about yeah. the effort that goes in. And, and so that's, you know, and you know, obviously the teddy bear is, is still around, and, you know, even even to the Trumpy bear. Act. Look, look at full circle. Here we came. The president are still driving the bears. So <laughs> Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So what um what is the the general if you're just a, a basic membership for Pope and Young, what's that what's that cost a person? You know, it's a, it's a um, thirty five dollars a year. There's specials and different things we have. Or if you sign, if you get an entry, it's thirty five. If not, it's forty. But we run promos and whatnot just for an introductory membership, um, and that's all outlined on the website. You know, and again, you don't have to be a member to come to convention. You don't. You know, you can get on the website. You can check everything out. We're not. You know, we'd love you to join on as a regular. You know, as a general member to be a part of it, but. You know, there's there's no there's no rules. There's no you have to have taken an animal or you have to only hunt with a bow. You know, we just want any conservation minded folks that think that the preservation, promotion, protection and preservation of bow hunting is important. You know, come join our ranks. And I think one thing I can I can add to that is especially knowing you um, and Dylan, who's also, um, you know, a part of Pope and Young is ethical. I mean, it's just you, you. one thing that I, I I can tell you that holds true every conversation I've had with you, um, it's is definitely the ethical part of it, and and I think you also, Justin personally, you bring in. Um, I've had I've had a couple of conversations with you on things with regards to the bio, bio, biology or the, you know how that affects scientifically, you know you know the, the ebb and flow, if you will, um, with regards to 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 the hunting and all of that. Um, for definitely, you know, coming from your standpoint. Yeah, no, and I mean that that was that was my background was wildlife. And I, you know, I, I thought I'd be working for a state as a biologist. That was kind of the career path I started. But then, you know, the the conservation world I had an opportunity to step into B and C. And I, you know, I do miss a little bit of the science side. I mean, that that is fun getting to be out there and handle critters and all that. But, you know, I, I feel like the ethics and the funding and 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 the model of conservation that we have, you know, that was kind of my calling. And and you know, I feel like those involved with these outdoor organizations, you know, that that is the future to ensure that it goes 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 forward. And, you know, you hear a lot of debate and like, oh, you got to follow the science. Well, man, the science started with hunters. You know, the very first wildlife funded um, oh, research that was done in the United States was was uh, Aldo Leupold was working for the Forest Service in Arizona and Boone and Crockett actually funded him doing a game management um, handbook for the Forest Service. And so the scientific management of wildlife has always been hunter driven, naturalist driven. You know, we started this and I, I feel like, you know, I like to bring a part of that too, because at the end of the day, we're not, we're not arguing from emotion. We're not arguing from, you know, oh, we, we have this right. We're saying, hey, here's, here's what we did. Here's the methodology that was used. You know, here's how we recovered these species. And here's how we deal with challenges coming forward through the science and then we're not just yelling with pure emotion. And I feel like that's always a more productive discussion. Yeah, for sure. So for any listeners out there, um, obviously Pope and Young, uh, you're on Instagram, you're on um, Twitter X, you're on Facebook. Um, you can, you got your, you guys have your own website and, you know, all the, all the standard places you can go out there and, um, you know, just like, just like, uh, you know, any, any other organization or, or, you know, uh, company that's in that world, um, unless you go out and you seek that information, it's going to be suppressed and kept from you. So you're not going to see it in your general feeds and stuff like that. So make sure that you go out and, and, you know, make the effort to, to, to look up Pope and Young and, and like them, subscribe and all of that good stuff. And, and I would tell you that, I, you know, I know money's tight right now, but it, I, I would encourage you to go out and, and become a member um, it's, it goes to, to a good cause. Justin is, you know, the executive director. And I, mean, I can tell you that his knowledge is, is vast. Um, we haven't even brushed the surface, you know, the other conversations and stuff that we've had together. Um, I've walked away, you know, every time learning something. And so, 
Um, I think it's a great organization. I'm proud to be a part of it. And I, I would 100% recommend, um, you know, going out and familiarizing yourself and joining it. It's, it's, it'll be, you'll be pleasantly surprised. I can assure you. One final thing, Kip, do you have your uh, deer slam raffle tickets yet? I do not have mine has yet. Dylan told, well, what's that? Have you, has Dylan told you about this one? He did tell me about it and I did see it, um, on one of the social media platforms the other day. Um, I think just like, didn't it just, just go live like this week? Yeah, we've, we've been kind of working on it for a while. What we've got set up here is that there's, you know, again, there's five species of deer that can be hunted, you know, in North America for our record book. And if you put in for this, the grand prize winner, if you've never taken a deer with a bow, you win five hunts. Say, for example, myself, I've taken three different species with a bow. So if I'm the grand prize winner, I get to go hunt those two species of deer I have not killed with a bow. Even if you've already killed all five with a bow, we still guarantee you you're going to get two hunts. And then if somebody, you know, again, that has, has already killed three or four, we're going to draw for those other three hunts and give those to the winners further down. And so it's a really awesome opportunity to go hunt with some really great outfitters and just see all the different species of deer. You know, there's there's two blacktails, the, you know, Alaska, the Sitka blacktail. You've got the Columbia blacktail and Washington, Oregon and uh, Northern California. You got the cows deer in Arizona, mule deer, you know, most all of the West, east of the, east of the, um, both Cascade Mountains and then whitetail, obviously. So, you know, it's a really cool opportunity. All the money goes to support Pope and Young and our, and our mission. And you might get to go on five deer hunts. That's pretty cool. And that's a, you know, great, great, um, a great uh, deal to get entered in for, especially for people that haven't hunted, you know I mean? For myself, um, I've never harvested a white, I mean, a mule deer. Uh, I've harvested whitetail and that's the only one that I've harvested. So um, been whitetail, you know, been deer hunting for 25, 30 years, 30 years. But as a 30 year veteran of deer hunting, I've only harvested one species. I've been mule hunting, yeah. mule deer hunting before, um, but we were not successful um, in, in in harvesting it. And you know, that's a, a great thing. The one that I just saw was the bear hunt. Wasn't there a bear hunt that that Pope and Young's doing? Yeah. So that was that we're doing that. That was in conjunction with that uh, shotgun that you guys donated. And so we did some regional events. And if you bought one of the one of the items at the regional event it's a one in 25 chance to go on a bear hunt, but you know, you have to buy, buy one of the items. And that's what we've used that, that uh, shotgun that we had you do those custom shotguns for the events. Um, they are available online when we do our, our auctions they are always available online. So you and can there's one there more coming bid. in there. Yeah, there's one more. We're going to do an event in Texas that would be in um, January. We'll get those dates on the website as soon as they're finalized. And then they'll actually be the final, the final shotgun we do with you guys will be done at convention. And that would be the last one. And then it's a one in 25 for that bear hunt. Plus you get, you know, an amazing either print or, or gun like we've been working, you know, been doing at these. And so it's just another opportunity to to support Pope and Young and what we stand for. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we greatly appreciate that. We love doing it. We love supporting, you know, conservation groups like this. And, um, you know, we just couldn't be happier with, with uh, the relationship that we have with you guys. But, um, well, I greatly appreciate you, you know, being on here, Justin, and for, uh, you know, all of our listeners out there, if you've enjoyed this and you have not done so already, um, we would encourage you to go out and like, and subscribe wherever you're listening to us at, whatever, you know, podcast, wherever you get your podcast from. And then also, um, you know, go out and look us up on social media. You know, we need to need to continue to grow. And as we've kind of talked about before and, and, and said over and over, if, if you don't like and subscribe and you don't go out and follow us, um, then it's, it becomes next to impossible for us to grow. And, uh, so we greatly appreciate you spending your time with us, Justin, thank you for coming on here. I have greatly enjoyed it, uh, my time with you. And until next time, I am your host, Kip Etter, and this is the powder and string podcast. Thank you for joining in. Mm-hmm.